Okay, uh, very welcome to this uh, first session of the day three. And uh, today also we have very exciting talks. Uh, the first session will be chaired by Raghav Sharma, uh, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the National University of Singapore. So Raghav, uh, you can take over and uh, you can try to either share the slides and introduce the speaker. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the first session of third day of our 10th year celebration of Spin Dynamics at IIT Delhi. So, this session uh, will consist of seven talks. Three will be half an hour and four will be 15 minutes talks. So, I request all the speakers to adhere to the uh, time that is uh, 25 minutes for the 30 minute talk and 12 minutes for the 15 minute talk. So let me introduce our first speaker. So who is Do uh, Dr. Rohit Mirbal? So Dr. Rohit Mirbal is an assistant professor at the Department of Physics. He has recently joined. He has done his, his PhD from University of Delhi. And before joining IIT Kanpur, he was a postdoc fellow at NTU from 2016 to 2022. His research interests are nanomagnetism, spin transport, and high frequency spin dynamics in spin devices and terahertz spin tonics. So now over to uh, Professor uh, Ruiz Mirwal. Thanks, Raghav. Uh, probably I would like to share my screen. Uh, so. Okay. Is my screen visible? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank Professor Mudli and um, for organizing this wonderful event, uh, just in the occasion of the 10 year of the Spin Dynamics Laboratory at IIT Delhi. And of course, I would like to thank Raghav for giving me my nice introduction. So yeah, before NTU, I was also working in Japan for almost two years. And before that, I was in, in the US for a short postdoc. And uh, as Raghav mentioned, that I did my PhD in the University of Delhi. So, but from nanomagnetism from my PhD, I completely shift my focus on the spin transport from my first postdoc to uh, last postdoc. And then in last postdoc, we were, we were actually working on the terrace spintronics in the NTU. So let me introduce that uh, today's topic is controlling and probing of the spin. I am Rohit Medwal, currently working in Nanya, uh, this uh, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Kanpur. So, so main broadly focus of the interest research interest lies in the nanomagnetism, spin transfer technology, spin photonics, and then instant and open electron nanoscopy. So here we have started a new laboratory that opto spin tonics lab which will cover the material aspect, which is a nanomagnetic nano materials, and the gigahertz and terahertz technologies for the new domains, as we have been listening to the talk from the two days, that is spin hall effect, inverse spin hall effect, spin pumping, and magnetics, and domain wall motions for this making the new devices. And of course, the ultra-fast phenomena for the fast uh, speed devices, like the terahertz spin tronics, people are trying to increase the bandwidth of the Device the new devices and using the light based phenomena, or which you can say the short light based phenomena, and then the ultra sensitive sensors using the light based phenomena again. The, this is the lies in the terahertz domain. So, um, we are mainly focusing on the material aspects gigahertz spintronics, terahertz spintronics, and the electron nanoscopy. We do not only focus on the just imaging, basically, we are looking for the Open to electron microscope, microscopy where we can apply the current, we can apply the magnetic field, we can apply the voltages to see the magnetic domains in the TEM, which is the Lorentz using the Lorentz microscopy or differential phase contrast imaging. And we are also like uh, 
we an expertise in building the new tem chips like which is a tem mams based tem chips for doing all this transport measurements which we do on the probe station in the tem at nanoskills to study these domains magnetic domains so this was a broadly focus of my lab in the iit kanpur which we are going to build i recently joined two months before and then uh, i will carry forward this directions in the iit kanpur so we need the technology to build up so today morning when i was searching for the spin dynamics laboratory which was established by professor mudli in iit delhi so you see that just in 0.51 seconds we have like four like results so such an enormous amount of the results in ultra fast time scales or you can say the very short time scale is possible because of the integration of this storage process and transferring information in the device and which is mainly possible because of the two device memory device and logic device and their integration is also a key challenge to really realize this ultra fast device processing from one device to another device and data processing from one device to the another device so this is if we have been storing this data in this device we can store this data enormous amount of data and you can say by 2025 we can have a 35 gigabit data to make this digital universe and we have been storing this data in the dvd what would have been done we could extract these dvds one over the other and we can have drive over the moon so you can see that how much data we are storing day to day life and thanks to the technology where we have come from the 20th century where we were utilizing the ampere's law creating the magnetic field to store the informations by just a hosted field to a spin transfer technology where we are passing the current to a ferromagnet making the current unpolarized current to a polarized current and storing the informations using the pure spin current the spin current can be defined by the three means like the pure charge current which is unpolarized current when the population density of the up spin and down spin is equal we have just flow of the charge current whereas if you pass this current instead of the normal conductor to a ferromagnetic materials what you will realize that you have the population density of the up spin is higher as compared to the population density of the down spins as a result of this you have the charge current and the spin current and that is why we call this a spin polarized current based on the band structure of a material which through which we are passing this current we can decide that how much polarizations we can get from for this material uh, but we can have the another phenomena that is the spin orbit torque or spin orbit coupling in the ferromagnetic uh, in the materials where we can generate the pure spin current like the platinum which has a high spin orbit coupling and we can allow this unpolarized current to pass through the platinum and we have a two different polarizations depending on the up spin and down spin and we can have the two different propagation channel so as a result of this we have only the flow of angular momentum there is no flow of the charge to the system ideally we can create such a situation so that is the pure spin current and we can generate this spin current by the several means like the electricity light sound vibration and heat so i'll be mainly focusing my talk basically on the electricity and light so first we will go to this electricity where we have been discussing that we have the spin hall effect which can convert this electricity to light to the spin current probably we can convert the charge charge current to the spin current and the inverse spin hall effect we can convert the spin current to a charge current so we have the two effect spin hall effect and inverse spin hall effect i will not explain this because everybody know that and we have been discussing this almost two days what is spin hall effect and spin spin hall effect and we are mainly focus on this electrical measurements the spin pumping and inverse spin hall effect and spin torque ferromagnetic resonance so what is the spin pumping and inverse spin hall effect if you have a ferromagnetic material attached with a heavy metal or which you can the materials which has a high spin orbit coupling so you can see that the ferromagnetic material has magnetizations when you apply the external magnetic field we can uh, the material experience effective magnetic field which will allow the magnetizations to persist and align the magnetization in the direction of the applied magnetic field but we are, because of this precisionally taught but when we apply the hrf magnetic field we can allow this magnetizations to coherently persist and can this persisting magnetization can inject the spin current from the ferromagnetic material to a heavy metal like platinum and can gen, uh, can generate then platinum can use this inverse spin hall effect and can generate this convert this spin current to a charge current and we can detect the voltage and this is the inverse spin hall effect voltage which we can detect across the platinum
And this can be explained by very simple formula. The voltage which we receive depends on the spin to charge conversion efficiency. We can see that here. This is the spin to charge conversion efficiency. Let me take the pointer. So this is spin to charge conversion, how much spin is being pumped and how much is being converted to the platinum. So this is a, defined by the spin to charge conversion efficiency and how much spin current is being pumped. So these two, the product of these two and the constant parameters based on the device geometry. So we can establish this spin current, current which is being pumped into the system is can be characterized by the several means. Then, and we can see that the spin current which is being pumped mainly depend on the two factors. One is the spin mixing conductance that decide by the interface of the ferromagnetic materials with the heavy metal and the precision cone angle that at which at which particular angle this metal is precising so that we can generate the the total spin current and that spin current will be converted into the charge current. So this is the formula which explains that the, the direct relation within the spin mixing conductance and the precision cone angle of the paramagnetic material. And we can actually calculate the precision cone angles by the several mean by using the AMR method, by the power transmission method, and by, by, by power absorption method and by input power. So if somebody is interested, I can discuss this method in detail, but I'm just want to say that we can generate the spin current mainly because of the uh, spin current depends on the mainly two factors. That is the spin mixing conductance, how much the conductance of the uh, interface, the how much current is being pumped from the ferromagnetic material to a platinum and the precision cone angle. This is the current which has been pumped into the platinum. And so if we see that, the current which is being pumped into the platinum and we can calculate the from this very clearly the spin hall angle because we can once we have the spin current from this platinum and we can put this spin current value here in this uh, formula and we can see that we can actually we have the voltage from here and we can directly calculate the spin to charge conversion from the system so i just want to highlight this key point of this result is there are several methods people are trying to do using the spin hall effect measurements, inverse spin hall effect measurements, like the power absorption measurement, power input, uh, input power uh, measurement, and the power transmission measurement, and AMR measurement. And finally, what we observe that the spin to charge conversion estimation, or you can say the spin hall angle, is very critical parameter, and which should be frequency invariant, and there are the only method like the, in the we can use the power AMR method, and we can actually calculate the spin to charge conversion, which is a frequency invariant. So spin to charge conversion is a frequency invariant in the system, and we can use the AMR method to calculate the spin to charge conversion in the system. So this was just a glimpse, but what we were trying to do and understand that how this spin to charge conversion is being changed with the anisotropy of the ferromagnetic materials. So that was the interest of our point. So what we did, we just go the YIG thin film on the different substrate like the GGG on the 001, 011, and GG111. And what we clearly observed that we were able to grow very good epitaxial thin films of the YIG over the three different orientation of the GEG. And we can clearly observe this anisotropic line width in this three different, three different orientations of the YIG. And you can see that this YIG001 must have the cubic anisotropy based on this, the TM result, we have the cubic crystal. And we observed that the resonance field as well as line width has a cubic anisotropy. Whereas the 001 has a uniaxial plus the cubic. And we clearly observed that uniaxial cubic anisotropy in the YG001. And then triple one is like always, this is, this is uh, there is no cubic anisotropy, it's just a sphere. And we almost observed there's no cubic anisotropy in the system. So our interest was to generate an anisotropy, the magnetic crystal anisotropy in the YG, and by controlling the facet control group. And we clearly observe by the growth, growth, uh, growth control parameters and in the YG001 and YG111. What we observe in this, this is the, our, the resonance field as a function of the phi. We have the cubic anisotropy in the YG001, whereas the YG111, there is no cubic anisotropy in the system. So we made the device, this inverse pumping, uh, inverse spin hall effect measurement device, the spin pumping IST measurements for measurement, and we clearly observe that ISH voltage in the YIG PT interface. So we deposit the platinum on the top of the YIG and we made the 
this uh, the transport measurements, and we clearly observed that ISHE measurements in the YG100 and YG111. This is just a simple measurement. This is not that interest. Interest is how we can control this, the pumping from the YIG. So we, we I'm showing the result is YIG triple one, 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 so fine nanometer. We have this out of plane excitation and when clearly observed that the symmetric component of this inverse spin perfect voltage is a sine theta. Whereas in the case of the YIG 100, I observed that there is a modulation on the sine theta. So we were trying to find out the, what is the origin of this, what is basically the key parameter which is affected by this anisotropy in the system. We have this change in the line with the four-fold symmetry because of the cubic anisotropy, the resonance line width is also changing as a function of the plane orientation of the magnetic field. And we have the symmetry component which is also changing as a function of the in-plane orientation of the magnetic field. And which is quite resembles with the our TEM results, which shows that the YG triple one there is no cubic anisotropy, whereas YG zero zero one has a cubic anisotropy. So we try to find out the reason. So we know that the spin current which is being pumped from the YG to the platinum depends on the spin mixing inductance and then spin precision cone angle. And we clearly observe that when we <coughs> calculate the spin mixing inductance by this formula, the changing the line width, and we see that the, the phase of this the YIG PT and then YIG change in the uh, YIG, the delta line width observing the pure YIG sample and the line width observing the YIG PT, the phase is almost same and even the amplitude is all more or less same. So we observe within the error bar, there is no change in the <coughs> experiencing reluctance at the interface. What we clearly observe, when we did the power dependent measurement, power absorption measurement in the YIG 100 and YIG 111, and we clearly observe that and this measurement is done at about the saturation field so that there is no other contributions. And triple one has this CPW, uh, this twofold anisotropy because of the CPW, because we have the CPW effect also. And then YG triple one, one, one zero zero, we have this additional contribution because of the cubic magnetic crystal anisotropy in the YG. So when we deconvolute this our spectra, and we can clearly see that the crystal fields or you can say the crystal anisotropy field in the YIG also dominate over the spin pumping voltage in the system, not only the device geometry. So we can really deconvolute our VISHE into the two component that is a, because of the device geometry, which is a sine theta and plus the fourfold anisotropy because of the crystal field orientations in the YIG crystals. So this is the demonstration that we have shown that the crystal field anisotropy also depends on the <coughs> also effect on the spin pumping measurements. So, and we are also trying to build up this new, uh, new materials for the enhancement of this spin to charge or charge to spin conversion into the platinum. For that, we are also doing this charge to spin conversion measurements using the STFMR. And then everybody know that when we apply the charge current to the platinum, we can generate the spin current and this spin current we can exert a torque on the magnetization direction and can allow these magnetization to persist in the ferromagnetic material and you may, we make the utilize of this effect that is a spin torque ferromagnetic resonance to detect the charge to spin conversions and we are interested in building the new materials or designing the new materials for this higher conversion efficiency from charge to spin conversion for that we use the ion implantation technique the standard processor was trying to create a interface or you can say the change in the potential gradient so that we can enhance the spin orbit coupling in the heavy metal. So for that, we deposit the platinum and cap with the MG and LO interfaces. So I'll show you this, my TM results. So a, a, a MG and LO interfaces, and we try to implant the platinum all in the PT. So we try, we did the implantation. Then after that, we remove this AMG and LO interfaces and we deposit the ferromagnet after that, so that we have our, we don't disturb the, <coughs> our heavy metal. So, what we observe that we can, we did the ELS mapping of this material after the implantations. We clearly observe the sulfur has been implanted into the platinum and which is almost quite uniform. And we calculate the percentage of sulfur using the ELS measurements. And we clearly see that this is almost approximately 10% sulfur is being implanted. And then not only the sulfur is a sulfur, it's just making the bond with the platinum. Those ways we have the platinum sulfide as well in the system. 
with it the, we made the photolithic using the photolithography we made the devices out of it and then we just did the stfmr measurements and we clearly observe the spectra the stfmr spectra for the pt uh, permaloy and i just want to highlight that the pt and permaloy and the pts and permaloy both the devices were made in the same sequence it's like the iron milling was done for the we have the pure platinum we iron mill for the mgo and alo interfaces for the pt also and PTS also, we just iron mill the MGU and ALO interfaces so that we, we can compare the results. So our control sample also grown in the same conditions. So we have the STFMI spectra for the both the cases, and we can clearly see from the spectra itself, there is a larger shift in the symmetric component as uh, uh, there's a larger shift at the negative, uh, negative field so that we have the higher component of the symmetric component in our spectra. So when we deconclude this spectra as compared to the PT and PTS, we can clearly see the symmetric component is higher in the PTS. And interestingly, we also observe there is no breaking of the spin orbit talk in the, in the platinum or even after implantation of the sulfur in the system. That was interesting. And we can see, we can further enhance almost three times spin to charge conversion in the PT after the implantation. So this was the three times enhancement or we can say from the 10% to a 30% spin to charge or charge to spin conversion into the platinum. So we were also doing the temperature dependent measurement. I didn't so because of the time we have tried to uh, do the temperature dependent measurement, try to find out what is the main origin of this. This was the intrinsic dirty intrinsic mechanism because of the dirty metal regime. And then we can see that we have the larger spin hole conductivity as well as we can have the 50% spin to charge conversion in the same material at 10 Kelvin. So this is a, this can be a very good candidate for the MLM implications and also for the low power microwave sources using spin talk nano oscillators, which Professor Mudli is really working on that direction. So we are also trying to understand this effect at the ultra fast time scales. Now we are currently working on the gigahertz technology. We are exciting our paramagnetic materials using the gigahertz frequencies or HRF frequencies. But if we want to cover the terahertz regime, what are the possible mechanisms which we can look for? So the answer is like the ultra short pulses. If we shine the ultra short pulses on the ferromagnetic materials, we can excite them out of equilibrium and can result in the ultra short super diffusive spun transport phenomena and which can result in the ultra, ultra fast terahertz pulses. For that, we are my focus shift from the electrical measurement to the optical measurements, and we are using the light to generate the spin current and the spin current to again generate the light. So you can see that what we did for our geometry, we removed the FO, this HRF field and we just shine the ultra short pulses on the ferromagnetic materials and excite them out of the vision. And we can generate this spin current from these ferromagnetic materials and we can now cannot use the electrical measurements to detect this. So we, rever we remove this and we just go the electro optic sampling measurements and we just can detect the terahertz photons using the this measurement. So what is the basic mechanism lies here and what so that which can result this ultra, ultra, ultra fast spin current. So this was in 1996, this PRL paper has clearly showed that when you shine a light on the ferromagnetic materials, there is a quenching of the, de, the ferromagnetic order. So we can, we call it demagnetization. It's very common that everybody observe that when you heat the sample, because laser is a very good source of the heat, when you shine a later laser on the ferromagnetic material, you can heat the material. And when you heat, you can basically increase the attempt, uh, you can re re really demagnetize the material. So it's very common. And you can just, if we, if we see that about the period of pressure, magnetic order reduces. But what is so interesting here, that the whole community really look for the results, this reverse, uh, really going behind these results was how fast we can actually quench these magnetizations. This is a 100 to 300 frames per second time scale. Such an ultra fast phenomena. And we make utilize of this and try to understand what could be the different origins. People were trying to say this is the electron scattering, electron phone on electron magnetic scattering, but let's see the time scale which lies, which generally happen, this phenomena has happened in this range. So electron electron scattering generally happens in the frame per second time scale from 10 to 100 frame per seconds. Where the phonons generally happen in picosecond time scale, magnons generally forms in the nanosecond, picosecond to nanosecond time scales. But there was another report that, okay, we can have a super diffusive spin transport phenomena where when you shine a light on the ferromagnetic materials, 
you can excite the spins far out of equilibrium. As a result of this, you have the excitation of majority and the minority spins. The minority spins scattered more and their group velocity is less. As compared to this, the majority spins scattered faster and their group velocity is also higher, which can really quench the magnetizations and can induce the magnetization of ferromagnetic materials as well as the spin pump the spin current from the ferromagnetic material to a heavy metal and can utilize the inverse spin hall effect in the heavy metal can generate this transient charge current or the transient spin current into the transient charge current and give rise to a terahertz photon. And this char transient charge current, which is being generated, generating the terahertz photon, depends on the spin to charge conversion efficiency of the heavy metal and the magnetization direction of the ferromagnetic material. We make use of these two key parameters, try to demonstrate that by changing the spin hall angle of the ferromagnetic materials or the you can say or the heavy metals from the platinum to tungsten we can reverse the terahertz electric field amplitude from the positive to negative and we can add this by coupling them so that we can add the vector vectorically and we can add this and we can further enhance the terahertz amplitude and we can also use the direction of magnetization to control the the terahertz amplitude by changing by sweeping the magnetic field and you can see this is our top vsm results and this is our terahertz terahertz magnetometer result we can clearly mimic the hysteresis loop which is being followed by the vsm and almost the same cohesivity <clears throat> interestingly we say, uh, we also want to understand that how this laser heat energy also affecting on this especially generating this uh, terahertz hysteresis from the terahertz magnetometer so what we did we what we did, we just do the uh, fluence dependent studies, but before that, we try to couple it. Like we can generate the terahertz photo, uh, terahertz sources, we can generate using the spin tonics emitters. We can also make the magnetometer. We just published this in the APL paper that we have shown that, oh, this is just uh, exactly uh, can be used for, like the VSM or we can move. We are using the similarly, this terahertz sources that can, uh, this uh, spin tonics emitter can also be used to uh, measure the ferromagnetic materials property. And we can also use this is the spintronics modulators where we can generate, uh, we can actually modulate this terahertz sources by heat or by light. So, what is this scheme? This is the photothermal scheme. We shine a light, we have the hysteresis, terahertz hysteresis. But when you shine a light, we can heat it, we can quench this hysteresis. And you can see this our experimental data, we can really quench this hysteresis by changing the fluence and what the interesting is like initially our terahertz photon is here but we can change the terahertz the direction the, or the origin the face of the terahertz photon by keep by standing on this the same magnetic field and just by changing the laser fluence so you can see that this is our spectra uh, <coughs> this is the coercive field from the recorded from the pulses we can see <coughs> initially the coercive field is high as a, when the laser fluence is low and when we keep increasing the laser, laser fluence the our terahertz the coercive field is getting low and then is saturated. And at the same time, we our spin current also increases and we can see that the increase in the amplitude of the terahertz spin current. And we can, we can use, make use of this technique by, by making this, the photothermal switching from this one phase to another phase, sitting at the one constant magnetic field. And we try to extend this to another type of switching that is a magnetoelectric switching. So what we did, we tried to design this spintronics emitters on the PM and PT substrate. And we can control this because we know that because of the piezoelectric orders, we can control in the PM and PT by applied application of the electric field. And what we did, we made these devices and we just check you the, from the X-ray diffraction that can we just really create a strain? Can we control the strain in the crystal? And yes, we can control the crystal. And you can see this relative strain in the crystal as a function of electric field. And when we measure the terahertz pulse amplitude from this, and we can see clearly that the terahertz pulse amplitude can, is modulated as a function of the strain. And this is exactly mimicking the same butterfly behavior which we generally observe for the strain. And we showed that we can, by the changing the by changing the electric field only, we can reverse the phase of the light. And this is the another example, example for the electric phase control switching of the terror spin current using the pure electric field. And this paper is under review in the nanoletter. With this, I would like to thank for uh, listening to me.
and the session is open for the discussion. Hi, so Sajid has a question. So Sajid, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Rohit. Uh, excellent, excellent talk. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, it's just a simple that how did you grow uh, EEG uh, for the experiment? Is, uh, Sorry? Uh, uh, how did you grow EEG? Uh, Itrimia or garnet? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we are growing EEG using the sputtering, RF sputtering. Ah, okay. Great. Okay, so um, okay, next. Um, uh, so uh, when you when you make a sulfide, uh, okay, oh, sorry. When is any specific uh, reason like uh, we can discuss? Uh, no, uh, no, yeah, no, not much, but uh, okay, we can discuss. But uh, the, the interesting part is that when you um, uh, deposit sulfur uh, in platinum, so yeah. is a platinum sulfur or did you try Raman on that to see if it is a disulfide? Or okay, and uh, how resistivity increased uh, or decreased by putting sulfur on how many how much order of that? Uh, okay, I, okay. I will ask you later, but uh, yeah, uh, you can. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay, Raman, we, we did not try Raman because very frankly, uh, if you can see that when we deposit sulfur, this is just uh, after the implantation. You can see the sulfur is everywhere on the top, and we have this stopping layer MG and ALO interface. And we have we intentionally put this so that we can stop most of the sulfur in this. And we have to iron mill and just get rid of this extra sulfur and deposit the plat uh, on the ferromagnet on the top of this. So okay. if you do the Raman of this, definitely you'll get the sulfur anywhere. Okay, so it is not a platinum disulfide anymore in, in, in yours. No, the so platinum because yeah, this is not the platinum because it's ALO, MGO, everything is there on the top. So this is a okay. stopping layer. Okay. okay, so this was the first question. Second question is like, yeah, so resistivity was higher after implantation of the sulfur. Yes. Okay, oh, and it is higher. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then, uh, in, in addition to that, I would like to mention the spin hole conductivity was also higher. Uh, right, because I can see the resonance field is shifting when you when you have yes. platinum desulfide. Uh, as compared to platinum, so your resistivity, your, your resonance field is going higher. I can the, I can see that your magnetization of the nickel iron increased a little bit if yeah, you put yeah. platinum desulfide. How yeah. uh, how it happens? Uh, because is it possible? Here, yeah. right? Here, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So you can see, as we know that uh, I don't know whether uh, this is a, a good way to present, but uh, as we know that when we have the platinum and the YIG. Oh, sorry, platinum and then permalloy. So you have always the, if you take the ferromagnetic resonance of the pure permalloy and permalloy with the platinum, you always see the decrease in the effective magnetizations. Am I right? So that is because of the, the small component of the outer plane isotropy or because of the spin pumping, there is an additional component which arises and reduces the effective magnetization to a lower, like the MS and then give rise to effective magnetization. But if you keep increasing the spin orbit torque or spin orbit coupling the, in the material which has been attached to the ferromagnetic material, you have the further enhancement in the effective field. And as a result of this, you have the resonance field at the higher magnetic field. So you expect large spin orbit coupling in self platinum. Yeah. And, uh, okay. and we have so there is a theoretical number for that? Do you Sorry? have any theoretical number on for that? Uh, how much increase in how possible like number increase in the, in the sulfur doped platinum? Because this platinum yeah, is already uh, very high. This is thirty percent here. Yeah. Uh, no, the spin orbit coupling. Sorry, the spin orbit yeah, coupling. That, that 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 I don't have particular number. Yeah. Uh, the, and the nice one, the the, the terahertz measurement, which is very exciting. The the magnetization hysteresis that it will produce with the terahertz. Yeah. Uh, do you have any any factor which uh, basically correlate the magnetization value? Because the magnetization oh, yeah. value calculation yeah. is. is that's that's a very interesting question, and uh, very frankly, we have one paper which is going in the PRL nowadays. It's, it's like coming back, going back, coming back, going back, two three times. Then what we are also trying to do that, but it's, it's still not very clear because we have to take the detector response and then emission response, and then so many responses are there in between, right? So every time there is a loss. So. Every time you have to calculate, we can only check the direction. We cannot actually cal really calculate the magnetic movement from this. So uh, no, no comment on this because it's, it's, it's not, I think, in my opinion, like it's, it's very difficult or like uh, if somebody is it possible? 
or is, uh, because it uh, depends on the direction of meditation not the magnitude uh, of the meditation oh okay okay it doesn't depend on the magnitude it just depend on the direction of meditation that's that's my feeling so in my opinion no maybe somebody can come up with a new idea thank you thank you very much uh, rahul has a question so rahul you can ask sure sure maybe a quick question yeah hello i have a just quick question thank you for the nice talk professor orit i have a question related to the strain so uh, as you mentioned yeah, one yeah. of your slide yeah 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 so yeah in this the in the same slide uh, you said uh, if you have a maximum strain you get maximum tail hard electric field right in the right no, actually okay so uh, uh, so basically so can i repeat the question or like mike if i repeat the question if i understood correctly so you saying that ki maximum strain has maximum terahertz yes so what is the possible reason for that okay so basically we can see that clearly when we have maximum stress that uh, this films are actually depends on the direction of the z axis of the meditation so we have the z axis and the, along the maximum strain if we have the change the strain then the orientation of meditation changes the terahertz amplitude decreases so it depends on the easy axis of meditation so we have done this uh, we can say the mh loop as a function of the electric field with the angle and it clearly depend on the easy axis of meditation it like it can have been it, it can be maximum at the maximum or it can be minimum on the maximum depend on the easy axis which you have grown on the strain film but if what about if we are in the saturation field and you if, yeah. if you apply a different strain yeah okay so if you are in the saturation field so you don't see saturation field which field electric field or magnetic field magnetic field okay so if you if you see okay this measurements yeah it's a interesting question so you can, i will try to highlight very clearly that these measurements are done at the remanent magnetization field so you can only observe this type of effect in the remanent magnetization if you saturate this so you don't observe the change in the terahertz as a function of electric field it's same okay okay does it also okay. depend on the conductivity or resistivity of the material sorry does it also depends on the resistivity or conductivity of the material uh the amplitude of terahertz yes yes of course yeah is it depends on the spin hole conductivity of the material so there is a one very good paper in the nature of photonics from the tobias comfort it clearly shows that the with the spin hole conductivity and the conductivity this depends it do depend on the on that okay thank you Okay. Uh, let me allow one final question, which is uh, Sachin has raised a hand. So Sachin, you can ask. Yeah, Sachin. Yeah, please ask a very quick question because we are okay. running out of time. Okay, I will be very quick. Uh, so you use copper as the capping layer, and uh, can you estimate the oxidation of copper and the conductivity of copper from your measurement? Sorry, I did not use any copper. Maybe on the top uh, in one of the slide. I joined very late, but. in the previous slide uh where uh, can you just uh... i don't uh, i i don't know the slide number but okay okay then maybe uh i'm sorry actually i i, I really never use the copper in my experiment and i can see that go through the slides if i wrote by mistake uh, uh apologies but really i didn't show any copper right okay then maybe i i missed the slide okay sorry okay then okay. Pro, uh, thank you professor rohit so we can move to the next you can call me rohit you have been hi <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay okay thanks 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 okay bye